The other day, I had the blessing of actually getting to meet personally one of the people I interviewed previously on Beat Diabetes. Most of my interviews are done over the phone with a camera trained on each of us. They send me their video file and I stitch our two videos together with my video editing software. But last week, I was able to actually meet and have lunch with Tom Kellen. And afterward, we went to a local park to discuss the progress he's made since doing that interview not quite a year ago. Well, Tom, welcome to McKinney, Texas. Hey, thank you, Dennis. It's great to be here. Right. Tom, uh, you were on, I had to look it up, You, I interviewed you by Zoom, or not by Zoom, but uh, the process we use, uh, back in June of last year. So it has not been quite a year, and just uh, to refresh everybody's memory, the thing that uh, uh, that amazed me about you was, number one, you... You have a CPA background and you are very detail oriented and you applied that to diabetes. And then um, you went through a long period where you got close to diabetes, you backed off of it for a while, then you kind of edged your way close to it again and went a little bit past it and then you backed off again. So the question is, how have you been doing since June of last year? How are things going for you? I have remained backed off. <laughs> That's the okay. best way to say it. Uh, since June of last year, we took a little road trip in the fall. And of course, traveling makes it much more difficult to uh, keep your blood sugars at a semi-stable level because uh, it's, it's difficult to get, get the right amount of uh, proteins and fats and less of the carbs but um, but it, it, it's worked it worked out pretty well we got back from the road trip and I had a doctor's appointment my a1c had gone up I believe to 5.3 and uh, once we were back home again I was able to consistently uh, lower it uh, lower the uh, blood sugar readings which I take twice a day once in the morning and once in the evening and sometimes um, once in, once during the day itself but um, so we um, we managed to keep it uh, keep it lower and then um, in the uh, winter time um, they started edging up uh, and um, just uh, a slight bit and my uh, had an A1C test uh, last month, April, and uh, it was uh, 5.1, which w which was uh, fine. Uh, it shows that I'm still still in a good range. I was just uh, amazed to think about the fact that you're in your 70s and you've got better glucose now than you've had probably for the last 25 years or so. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh, once you. Um, I think that's a testament just to the low carb nutritional program. You, um, if you if you cut your carbs, I mean, look at Dr. Bernstein. Of course, he's a type one diabetic, so it's a little bit different rules for him. But but he's the pioneer in this very low carb uh, diet, and it's uh, he's almost 88. He'll be 88 June 17th. Okay. So uh, you know he. He's the, he's the master at, at teaching us how to do it, and um, uh, I, I try and uh, continue w with his philosophies, you know, higher protein, um, very low carb, and the f fat comes along with the protein. Yeah, you know, as I was, I uh, listened to the interview I did with you uh, just today, this morning, just to refresh myself on your story. And you were talking about how that it, uh, as you were struggling and, and, and dealing with uh, high glucose numbers, uh, you had kind of a uh, two different sides hitting you. On the one hand, you were reading Dr. Bernstein. He was talking about low carb. On the other hand, you were going to some kind of a diabetic class or clinic, and they were yes. telling you eat more carbs, just make sure they're the so-called healthy carbs. Uh, and you finally, at some point, made the decision to go with Dr. Bernstein's, and I get the feeling you're kind of happy that you went that way. <laughs> yeah, very accurate, very accurate. There's, I mean, the the proof is in the pudding, as they say, and uh, all you've got to do is uh, keep checking with Mike and 
he'll take care of you. Yeah. Do you do you know about any of your other lipids? Uh, you know the the kind of things that deal with cholesterol, LDL, fat, uh, the 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 fluffy particles versus the dense. Or do you ever check that out at all? Oh yes, about every uh, appointment, which is every six months, I, I get the I get the lipid uh, analysis and. Uh, um, last uh, the last couple of times, uh, I also had a in- fasting insulin uh, test, which which was very low and very good, and the doctor was pleased. I was pleased, uh, but my cholesterol has my LDL cholesterol has been since I've been doing this very low carb, especially very low carb for the last four or five years, uh, pretty fervently. Uh, the LDL has gone up, uh, which mm-hmm. makes the total cholesterol go up. Right. However, my my triglycerides um, and my HDL are are very good. My last um, my last test last month, the triglycerides were 88, I believe, and my HDL was 92. So that ratio of trigs to HDL is less than one, which is outstanding yeah that so. is excellent you know I thought about this the other day it's kind of funny uh, people that don't really know much about low carb or anything if they hear you are eating low carb they'll say oh well, I don't know about that cholesterol I bet you got high cholesterol but they never say anything about triglycerides it's like oh I bet mm-hmm. your triglycerides are up the right. truth is I've never hardly I think th- in all the interactions I've had with diabetics there's been one person who told me their triglycerides went up when they went low carb everybody else says they go down and it certainly proved that way for you yes uh, you're in your 70s your your health is relatively good you mentioned you've got some inflammation issues but uh, looks to me like uh, you're winning <laughs> I, ho- I hope so I, I hope so yeah that you just got to keep fighting that's all there is to it you, I'm eating the same types of foods and the same amounts of foods mm-hmm. um, three meals a day no snacks uh, once in a while I have a dessert and that's usually at breakfast believe it or not okay. and um, and that's, uh, but I, I have it, I have it with the meal at the end of the meal. A low carb dessert, relatively yes. Okay. It's, it's, yeah, it's usually um, some concoction that my uh, wonderful wife puts together, and we, we add a little. It's very low carb, but we will add some whipped cream and some cinnamon, and uh, we're good to go with that. But no other, uh, no other snacks during the day. And that was quite an adjustment for a while. <laughs> I told you about my old habits of uh, hostess cherry pies. No offense to hostess. <laughs> Pure sugar. After talking with Tom, I got to thinking about what it takes to keep your glucose numbers in the non-diabetic range for a lifetime. I put together four keys that I feel are the means by which you can not only get your glucose levels down, close to normal, but keep them in that range for the rest of your life, hopefully well into your 80s or 90s or beyond. The first key is pretty basic, and that is a low-carbohydrate lifestyle. No, I didn't say a diet. I said a lifestyle. It's not a matter of deciding that low-carb is some crash intervention that you're going to use for a few months to bring your glucose in line. It is a lifestyle that you're going to need to practice throughout the remaining decades of your life. When you are 55, you're going to be eating low-carb meals. And when you're 67, you'll still be eating low-carb. At 75, guess what? You'll still be eating eggs and salads and hamburger patties and avocados and chaffles and nuts and seeds and putting heavy cream in your coffee and completely avoiding things like chips, pretzels, donuts, pastries, pasta, breakfast cereal, honey, potatoes, rice, fruit, fruit pies, fruit juice, and so forth. You should plan on eating the proper way, the low-carb way, and living that way for decade after decade until the Lord calls you home. The Bible says if your hand offends you, cut it off. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch to paraphrase that verse to say if carbohydrates of all kinds drive your glucose levels high and offend your body, then cut them out of your diet. 
A second key is making your low-carb lifestyle one you can actually and easily live with all your days. That means you're going to have to put together enough foods and meals that you actually enjoy <laughs> your food, and you'll not be seriously tempted to fall off the wagon and run far from that wagon, screaming at the top of your lungs, I can't take this, I can't take this, I cannot take this. Now, there may be a few stoic, hearty souls who could live on a never-ending diet of eggs and cucumbers every day for decade after decade, but there aren't that many. If you're going to stay with a low-carb diet and sustain it for 10, 20, or 30 or more years, you're going to have to accumulate a group of meals that will have both variety and they'll taste great. Like it or not, you're going to have to do some research. Read books, watch YouTube videos, and find keto or low-carb meals that you enjoy, and more than just a few of them. Even though I've been eating low-carb meals, I'm still a meal and a low-carb food collector. I'm always on the lookout for great low-carb meals and foods and desserts that make my eating a little more pleasant. In fact, just doing this 2022 challenge has been a phenomenal blessing to me in learning about certain foods, especially chaffles and a keto version of oatmeal, which Benedict and I are going to demonstrate this Friday, the Lord willing. Yeah, I recognize it's a bit of a pain to try new meals and you have to go out and buy ingredients or order ingredients you never used to have to keep on hand, but it is well worth it. Your health and your life are at stake. If you just try to endure and hang in there eating the same old, dull, unexciting, boring, monotonous, low-carb foods night after night, day after day without ever expanding your repertoire of meals or enjoying a sweet keto treat occasionally, well, all I can say is you're probably an excellent candidate for falling away and going right back to all the junk foods that brought you to the precipice of destruction. So get out of your rut and start experimenting, trying new things, searching YouTube for new ideas for meals and substitutes for the high-carb foods that got you into trouble. And the good news is that never, never in the history of planet Earth has there been such a preponderance of recipes and videos showing you how to both enjoy your meals and keep your glucose from spiking. The knowledge is out there, my friend. All you have to do is get off your couch and put in a little effort. Even if you're a vegetarian, there's all kinds of low-carb vegetarian recipes you can try. But how would you know this if you don't do a little research? The third key has to do with motivation, the motivation that comes from regular glucose tests. And that means you test your glucose with a glucometer and with CGMs, if you can afford it, and also having an A1C test done regularly. Let me tell you one of the biggest reasons people gain weight. Let's just talk about weight for a minute. One reason people gain weight is, of course, your metabolic system is slowing down as you age. But another very big reason people gain weight is that they never, ever, ever weigh themselves. So they don't know that they weighed 145 two years ago. They don't know they weighed 152 last year and now they weigh 161 today. And because they see themselves every day in the mirror, they never really notice that the weight is really starting to accumulate. And they never project this out and consider that they're probably going to crack 200 pounds in about four more years. They just go about their days and their lives never getting on a scale, never noticing that obesity is overtaking them. Now, diabetes is the exact same way. If we never test ourselves and consider our glucose levels, we may be under the illusion that all is fine. After all, we feel good, we're enjoying our life, we're enjoying our meals, and there are no signs that anything is wrong. That is, until the day when we find that we're always thirsty, and we have to urinate 15 times a day, and the road signs seem to be harder than they ever used to to, to read, but if you have lowered your glucose into the non-diabetic range, don't set yourselves up for round two by never testing your glucose anymore and figuring, I've got it done. I've got this thing figured out. And don't uh, stop having A1Cs done. Don't just assume that because you beat it once, you'll be good for the rest of your life. Let your blood sugar meter keep you on the straight and narrow. 
And if you find yourself waking up with glucose levels that are 10, 15, or 20 points higher than they used to be, well, make some adjustments in a hurry. The fourth key to maintaining decent glucose levels has to do with continual exposure to the truths that you already know. This is also a motivational key. Once you get your blood sugar down into a decent range, you can't just forget about it and assume you'll be fine the rest of your days. And one important factor in keeping your motivation at a high level is stay involved with people who also practice the low-carb lifestyle. Get, invo get involved with low-carb Facebook groups, watch YouTube videos and channels, and yeah, this one, and of course, there are many other excellent content creators who speak about the importance of eating low-carb. Read good books, and there is certainly no shortage of excellent low-carbohydrate books that are pouring off the printing presses these days. You know, I find it interesting that some of the most insightful people who leave comments under my videos are men and women who have kept their glucose under control for years, some of them even decades. You might wonder, why are these guys even watching your videos? They've already won. And that is true, but it seems like by feeding their minds and spirits on truths that they've already come to know and believe, their motivation stays at a white-hot level, and it gives them that extra little push to keep on keeping on. Now, I fully realize that there's a whole lot more to life than just keeping our glucose levels in line. But if you have crossed over that boundary line of diabetes and then you made it safely back to a normal metabolic range, it is smart to keep your mind refreshed in the truths of low-carb eating and living. So that's it. The four keys are, one, move from a standard diet to a low-carb diet, Two, accumulate a large number of meals and foods so your diet has variety and your meals are enjoyable. Three, regularly test your glucose with your glucometer and by getting A1C tests. And four, continue soaking your mind in the benefits of low-carb eating and avoiding junk food, avoiding high-carb food, processed food, sugar, and grains. These four steps are a small price to pay for good health that may last you right into old age. And let me give you a bonus key. Why don't you pray to the Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ and ask Him for the grace of self-control and a lifetime of victory. We have it on very good authority that those who ask receive. Tom Kellen is doing this along with thousands and thousands of others who are happily enjoying better metabolic health in their latter years than they did in their middle years. God bless you. See you again soon.